Hello there, YouTube. I'm waving to you. See, I'm in the mirror. Uh huh. This is Mr. Gibson Guy. Welcome to my channel and Happy New Year. Today is January 1st, 2024, and this is going to be a really good year. I know it. Um, I know it because I started out with a really good thing today. And that's what the video is going to be about today. I'm going to bring to you. Um, <clears throat> when I started out in photography, it was in the mid 1970s. I started out, you know, borrowing some other people's cameras and using them. And then in uh, 1978, I got my own first camera. I was very excited about it, and boy, it just really lit a fire with me. I became very interested and excited about photography. And my first camera was the uh, very short-lived Minolta XG7. Now the XG7 was a brand new kind of camera that they were coming out with, which was uh, an automatic exposure camera of, made available to uh, new photographers, to, to uh, amateurs, to uh, hobbyists. Uh, the idea behind the XG7 was something like this. Oh, this is not an XG7, this is a Canon. This is the Canon AE-1. And the AE-1 camera was a new, a new direction in photography that camera Canon took. They took the chance. Uh, <clears throat> with coming out with their first of their A-series cameras. And these were cameras which, instead of being mechanical and metal, started being a lot more electronic and plastic, which meant several things. It was easier to make, it was easier to use, and so they could sell them at lower prices to people interested in photography. And after the Canon came out, the AE-1, all the other camera companies had to scramble because they had to get something that would give you the convenience of the AE-1 with the price of the AE-1 and make you want to get that instead of the Canon. But the Canon was a very big success. Um, now, when I started in photography. The AE-1 had been around a couple years and the other companies were coming out with their answers to the AE-1. And one of them was Minolta, which had come out with the XG-7. This isn't an XG-7. With an XG-7, which was their introductory uh, auto exposure camera that they brought out at a really decent price. The uh, XG7, I think, at the time that I got it, I'm not talking um, retail prices, the list price, but what the actual price in, in all the stores was. They kind of had like a map price, like a minimum advertised price that you, and everybody was selling for those. And like the basic SRT went for under $200 with a lens. The XG7 went for 220 to 230 with a 50mm f1.7 rule core X lens. And um, that was kind of like close to, you know, other cameras were about 250 and then you started getting into the expensive stuff and there was 300 and 400 dollars with lenses. So the XG7 was a real landmark camera. The Canon AE-1 was a full-size camera. And the XG7 was a compact camera, more along the lines of the OM1, OM2, Pentax MX or ME. Um, and uh, Olympus uh, Minolta, Minolta XG7 was their camera. And so I got it and I love the camera. Boy, this camera was just super. And it was auto exposure. I got an auto winder I put on it. Eventually I got the 200X flash unit that attached to it. And uh, well, that's coming up in another video. But I was real excited about what I could do with the XC7. 
Um, but the XG7 also was a budget camera. It was didn't have many frills on it. Uh, it started out being really exciting, but then I started to learn more about photography and things that I wanted to do, and uh, I, I was very limited as to what I could do with that camera. For example, they said that there's a way that you can uh, make multiple exposures if you push down this button here to, for the rewind after you have tight brought the film up taut and you try to advance it on some cameras you could get a double exposure keep your film there with the XG7 you couldn't and if you tried doing that what you would do would be <laughs> You, you would break one of the teeth off of the take-up spool in the film winding area and then you'd have to take it to the shop and have them replace that whole spool because it was made out of plastic and it was not meant to hold up to uh, abuse like that. So um, The XC7 was short-lived as I mentioned. It lived about eight or nine months and then Ulta came out with the improved version which was the XG9 and with the XG9, they, you know, they had a lot of people that bought XG7s, but we were all starting to say, well, hey, we need a little bit more than this. And that's what they did. The XG9 had a little periscope window, which gave you the viewfinder readout of the aperture selected on your lens, which is if you were in the right light and could see it reflected off. Um, it also did what I just described with multiple exposures so that you could do it without breaking the tooth off of the uh, take-up spool. Uh, so that was, uh, multiple exposures not a big thing, but uh, the other stuff was having that read out in the window. Also, it had a depth of field preview button on it, which you could get on the, some of the SRTs, but you couldn't get it on the XG7, and they put that on the 9. So that was a very big thing. I used to do this trick where I would get my picture ready, ready to go and set my aperture and then I would press the lens release button and without, you can turn the lens carefully without turning the aperture and when you get it to just about come off you look at it and you would get your depth of field captured as you hold the lens on the camera. And then you can twist it back like that and you saw your depth of field preview, then you can take your cam picture. But popping the lens off and back on to see depth of field, was, it's much better to have the button to do it, which this they did. Um, so we had that, 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 and uh, oh! The XG9 also featured metered manual. The XG7 had a full one second to one one thousandth of a second presets for you can set the manually set the shutter speed if you wanted it, but you didn't get any light metering. And with the XG9, they fixed it so you had this electrosensitive touch thing to get this going. Yeah, and on the on your shutter button, but. Uh, circling around that was a, a perimeter of shutter speeds and you could set the shutter speed but with the XG9 the red LED came on to what the meter suggested was the correct shutter speed. So the XG9 fixed everything that was missing on the XG7 and I really wanted one but I had just gotten the XG7 and of course now the XG9 was going to be $250 and the XG7 was now worthless because it had been improved so it wasn't much good. Uh, so I didn't get the XG9 although I dreamed about getting one for a long time. Um, uh, I really liked the look because this was my first camera. I liked the aesthetic of the Minolta and it was very, uh, it looked like what a camera was supposed to look like to me. Um, but eventually they came out with the X700 as the successor to the XG9 
and that one featured through the lens uh, flash and uh, it took a motor drive instead of an auto winder. Well, it took the auto winder too, but what could, you could use the MD1 motor drive on it, which was really cool. It gave you the fine the readouts and the manual exposure, and it even had program exposure on it. It was uh, Minolta's answer to the Canon A1. So somebody had to answer to that. Um, and like the Canon, like the XG7, the XG9, it was plastic on top and um, all electronic. Um, but then shortly after I got my X700 and I just had everything all set for my Minolta photography, I bought a uh, Nikon F2 Photomic in a pawn shop. And as soon as I started using the Nikon, I couldn't go back to the Minoltas. I just just didn't work for me anymore after using that F2. Uh, these all just kind of felt like toys. So what I did was I contacted KEH and I shipped all, all of my Minolta stuff to them and sold it to them. And they sent me back a check for you know some money because I had some Minolta stuff there. And uh, it, you know, it was still worth something. So I got some money out of it. and. Uh, put it back in, invested it into Nikon equipment from there on. And so that was it. I was done with Minolta and I never thought I would ever look back. Although I did really like the look of the uh, X7, XG7. XG7, XD, X, XG7, XG9, X700. So it was kind of a continuation. And then they, they went to the maxims and those were 7,000s and stuff. So their number system kept changing over and over. But I was out of the Minolta business, and I was just, Nikon was all I needed, and that was set with me. Well then, in current days, as, as we've seen here before, if you've seen my videos, uh, prices on cameras kind of just fell through the floor. And little by little, I started picking up some old film cameras here and there that Oh, I always wanted one of those. Look at that. A Pentax MX. I remember seeing those in the store. That was a really cool camera. The Pentax MX. You know, and I picked one up with the 50mm f1.4 lens for, I don't know, 60 bucks or something like that. And I noticed that the MXs were almost non-existent at eBay and stuff. So I got one. And it still works. The lens is wonderful. I've, uh, I can't argue with it. I picked up some other things. Uh, one thing that I uh, was kind of interested in in Minolta was I didn't care for the XG series or the X700s or the different hundreds, but there was another Minolta camera which was kind of the predecessor to the XG7. But it's a lot more camera, way lot more camera, and that is the XD11. So I started looking around thinking, oh, XD11 is kind of cool. And so I was looking around online and, you know, you can like put in Minolta XD11 and Google search it. And it'll come up with a whole line full of XD11s that are for sale. And so I looked and the prices were... You know, you know, $100 was considered a, a big, good price, um, you know, pretty good money a year ago. But now prices were starting to go up. I mean, an XG7 would probably go for 25 bucks with the f1.7 lens. So, so people would buy it for the lens and throw the camera away. But the XD11, that was going for well over 100 bucks. And then I found one that popped up on a Google search at this site called Mercari. And I looked at it and I kept looking at it and I thought it's really catching my attention. And then I realized it had the 50 millimeter F1.4 Rollcore X MD lens. And my Minolta has always had the 1.7s. The 1.4 was kind of like, that was for rich people. I never really thought I would get one, but I saw this XD11 on it, and it captured my attention and my interest. So 
I thought about it and I kept flipping back to it and seeing it again and again and, and uh, pretty soon uh, the, it, this one was I don't know, eighty, ninety dollars, something like that. It was under a hundred dollars with the fifty millimeter f one four, and so eventually it teased me so much, and it looked just like an XG seven, only really just right, and it had everything going with it. You know, it's got the blind in the back, and uh, a little window that shows when the film is being wound on it, so you know that it's actually progressing. But uh, Eventually, I bought this, sent off for it, and it came, even had the Minolta lens cap. See that? Yeah. Um, although it doesn't stay, it stays on, but not great. It's not the best lens cap design. But I eventually got, got it, and it came, and I was real excited about it. Now, the, the person selling it said in their description that uh, it seemed to work, but they're not photographers, so they didn't really know for sure. Well, yeah, and I found out what it was. The XG11 is an electronic controlled camera, but it has a mechanical shutter speed, shutter speeds really, of uh, 1 one twenty fifth of a second and and X or, or O, no B, B yes, bulb setting, which means you press it down and when you let the shutter up, it closes the shutter again. So without a battery, without it being turned on, without anything, if you have it on X, or not on X, on B or on O, the bulb or the O's, I don't know what it stands for, but that's that's the automatic, the mechanical shutter speed. It will still work. No meter, no other shutter speeds because it's all electronic. Um, but those work on it. I don't know if it would flash sync or not. I haven't tried it. I'll have to give that a shot. But I took it up took this stuff out and cleaned the whole thing off, rubbed it down with some rubbing, rubbing alcohol, cleaned out the battery compartment and everything like that, took a battery out of uh, Nikon FE and put it together and tried it and tried it. No LEDs, no joy, nothing's happening with it. Um, and I was severely disappointed because I really had a very strong attachment to this XD11 with this 1.4 lens on it. And it's really, uh, to me, like the ultimate amateur camera. It's not really a pro camera, but it's like a deluxe regular person camera. And it's made out of metal, it's not made out of plastic, it has the mechanical shutter speed, it has everything going for it. But it didn't work. And I thought, well, I'm, maybe I can get it fixed. I looked into places that will fix them, and I thought, you know, I've gotten a number of cameras that didn't work, and I messed with them, and I could get them to work. And for one thing or another, take the bottom off and put a little oil in the right place if you get some direction on where that is, and not in any other place. And you make a cannon that doesn't screech when you that use the shutter. Um, but I really wanted to get this XD going. And I put it on the shelf and made it just a collector's piece. It's, you know, it looks nice there. And it's the only Minolta. I probably won't ever have another Minolta next to it. It was sitting next to Canons and a Pentax, but uh, kind of surrounded by other cameras. But I really like the thing. And so I recently saw a video of a guy who had a uh, Olympus auto winder and he had fixed it with a q-tip and uh, some distilled white vinegar that he put in onto the contact points and rubbed it around a whole bunch and then you use a pencil eraser and clear off all the gunk around the contact points for the battery and eventually following his his uh, direction on it I got two Olympus a winder one and a winder two that both now work 
when you put the batteries in them because I use that uh, that cleaning method and this morning on the first of the new year I was thinking about my Minolta and I thought oh, I kind of want to clean that lens so I got some rubbing alcohol on a q-tip and I cleaned out the lens because it seemed to have some some dust and fingerprints and gooey stuff on it and I cleaned it off and the lens just looks wonderful now uh, and then I thought I wonder if I should, I'm, I'm going to try that. So I took a nickel and I popped off the battery compartment cover. And there's no battery in that. Put the cover aside. And then I took some uh, distilled white vinegar on a Q-tip. And I started really cleaning up around the contact and all the area around that area. And then there's also, I took off the bottom cap where the battery goes and I started cleaning off the inside because it makes contact in on to the battery co cover this uh, this little circular thing here that you take off with a nickel and then I put it back together took took some batteries out of the FE and put it in here and I held it up and the LED came on the LED came on, let's put the arrow at the top. So you yeah, have the different settings, manual, auto priority, aperture priority, and shutter priority. And you got, you got to set everything to the right settings. And I tried it, I can get it metered manual now. I can get it in aperture priority. I can get it in shutter priority. And I even tried the uh, green for green for go idea that Middleton came out with because this is really a program camera and set everything to where it was supposed to be for that where the camera will pick its own shutter speed and aperture and it does full programming and everything thanks to that distilled vinegar is now working in my cleaned up and really nice looking Minolta XD11 and I didn't have to send it off didn't have to pack it away and pay for shipping and wait for somebody to finally send me a bill for a couple hundred dollars for a hundred dollar camera. But it's not a hundred dollar camera now. It's more than a hundred dollar camera. And it's not going to be going to my eBay store. It's staying right in the cabinet where it belongs. So that was my happy tale about uh, a happy new year. That I'm having today and it's going to be a happy new year from here on <clears throat> starting with the XD11 that came back to life so if this was interesting to you or if you maybe you found a camera that you found dead and you brought it back to life drop me a line put some put a comment in there it's uh, it's really amazing how these 40 year old cameras can be brought back to life and everything just works again just like that it's really amazing they're, they're really well built and i'm glad that i got it so you can like and subscribe thanks for watching hope you enjoyed it and i'll see you on the next one this is mr gibson guy and the xd11 and we are out of here